Welcome everyone. We are day, uh, now in day two of our quick start week. This is an opportunity for us to cover in fairly rapid sequence a number of the critical issues that faculty and others may need to be aware of as they get started moving online. And a large part of this is giving you enough information so that you can make meaningful informed decisions as you start going online. And a key lesson, and Marta was just mentioning this as we were getting started earlier, a key lesson is that perfection isn't the goal here. It's uh, and selecting a tool that works. That's simple is a far better strategy than selecting a complex integrated suite of technologies that absolutely overwhelms your end users. So really want to promote and emphasize that do what works in the short term and allows you to stay connected with your students. Today we have an important topic that I think many of you are acutely aware of and that's you've got this mess of tools and how do you choose what you're going to use and when you're going to use it and what kind of guidance can we draw from the research literature. We have uh, two individuals that will be presenting today and we'll kick off with Negan first, followed by uh, Justin. And Negan, as you kick off, and Justin, maybe just do a little bit of an intro so people understand a bit more about your background. I know you have your introductory video online. Uh, again, we'll follow a similar format, about 10 minutes of presentation, followed by a bit of Q&A from each of them, and then a general Q&A as we wrap up. Thanks everybody for joining us. I know you all got a whole bunch going on. I'm afraid to open Twitter or any kind of a news app to see exactly how much worse the disaster of everything has gotten. So I hope you're all doing well and you're in a good place. Megan, over to you. Hi everyone, um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, this morning where I'm at, um, afternoon where some of you might be. Um, so a quick little introduction from myself. Um, I'm Negan. Um, I'm the Head of Curriculum Development and Support at the University of South Australia. Um, I've been involved in educational technology and online learning for well over 15 years now, um, both in Canada and in Australia um, during that time. Um, my work dominantly um, has been focused on helping academics um, shift from a face-to-face -face, uh, learning and teaching setting to a fully online setting. Um, Typically, as you probably know, um, that doesn't happen within 24 or 48 hours or a week. Um, it can take months and weeks and, um, of planning. However, um, times of crisis like now um, calls for quick action. So what I'm going to talk through with you today is really just some really basics as to how do you sort through the mess of different tools and technologies that are out there. Um, the session yesterday uh, covered planning, um, if you're doing online teaching and you're remote teaching, how do you get started and planning? Today's session, we'll touch really briefly on, um, on that, but moving really quickly into how do we select the tools and technologies to facilitate our students' learning experiences and our teaching experiences. Um, so with that, I am going to share my um, slides that I have for you today, so bear with me for a moment. All right, so lots of tools and technologies are available to you, um, but how do you get started um, trying to sort out through that mess? Um, so using and selecting tools is what um, today's session is focused on. But first, um, I just like to take a step back, um, not think about the tech for a moment, and think about what's your actual aim and your learning outcomes in your learning setting. So what is it that you actually want your students to be able to achieve um, after your lesson, essentially, or after your course, but you can even take it down to an individual lesson or hour session that you want to spend with them, um, or whatever it may be. But you really need to start thinking first about your aim, and your learning outcomes before you think about any sort of tool. Um, and that brings us to essentially what um, John Biggs calls uh, constructive alignment. Um, really that notion of you really want to be really clear what is it that students are going to learn, then you're going to teach them that, then you're going to assess them um, through that aligned system. So what's your aim? What do you expect your students to be able to achieve or to be able to demonstrate after the learning experience? Um, so just 
really quickly on the Align teaching because I think it's so important to be able to really know what that your aim is before you start looking at the technology. There's a lot of tools out there and you can easily get distracted if you don't know what your main aim is. So aim, what sort of activities are you thinking of? What sort of assessment? And then we can come to the fun stuff around the tools and technologies, which is the focus of today's session. So let's um, assume you have an aim, you've got your learning objective ready to go and your assessment, and you're ready to start um, pivoting to that remote online teaching space. Here we go, another range of different types of tools that are available to you, discussion forums, quizzes, self-tests, um, Dropbox and different places for students to drop in their assignments, uh, blogs, wikis, um, videos, uh, social networking sites, a huge range out there. Now, whenever I'm trying to select a tool or I'm um, working with academics to select a tool, um, I tend to go back to an oldie but a goodie, um, what's called the sections framework, um, which was designed by Tony Bates um, and Gary Poole back in 2003. Um, so it's not new, um, but it's one of my favorite little um, frameworks that I've just got tucked um, in my back pocket um, and I use it frequently when I'm trying to think about what tool is it um, that we're going to choose. So the first one, it's S, students. So first think about your students. What sort of tool is appropriate for your students? Who are your students? What sort of um, computer or laptop or mobile device or tablet do they have access to? Um, shifting over to remote teaching, not necessarily do all of the students have a desktop computer. Um, not necessarily do they have a laptop. They might be accessing your course material on a mobile device. So you want to consider when you're looking at the tool to use that it's mobile friendly. Um, and by doing that, you want to test it out on your own mobile device, at least, um, if not have some friends or colleagues to test it out on theirs as well to make sure it works. Um, and also for it to, you know, to work on a computer and a laptop as well. But you really want to make sure that all your students will be able to at least access the technology because as soon as they can, then, well, they can't access your course. So really think about what your student, who your students are, and what sort of access to technology they have. You might want to send around a little checklist um, to, say, to ask them what is their setup at home? What do they have access to? Um, do they have access to the internet? How much access to the internet do they have? Um, just so you have some understanding of your student's learning setting. Ease of use, um, really important, especially when you're quickly shifting to online. So you want the tool to be easy for you to use um, and likewise easy for your students to use. You don't want them to have to fiddle around too much with um, installing software or downloading certain apps. Like some apps are easy to download and that's great, but you really want to make sure it's easy to use. Um, think about that student who may not have a lot of technology background, for example, or is, like I said, working off a mobile device. Um, ease of use, really, really important, especially when you're trying to shift quickly. And your costs. Um, so some technologies and tools are free. Some have hidden costs associated with them um, or sometimes hidden ads associated with them. So um, you want to make sure you have an understanding of what sort of costs are associated. Talk to your institution. Um, what are they offering? Because then at least you know it's locally hosted or it's locally supported um, and you don't have to have any costs associated with it. Um, but if you know, your institution doesn't have the types of tools that you want, say you want to use a blog and there's not a particular blogging software available to you, um, you know, and you want to use WordPress or other types of blogs that are out there, you want to make sure um, there's not a lot of costs or any costs for your students or for yourself, really. T um, from that framework <clears throat> is teaching and learning. So, you know, you're not just throwing the tool at the students, but obviously it needs to align with that rest of the curriculum um, and support the learning outcomes. Um, maybe make your teaching more efficient. Um, you're shifting to a completely new um, teaching 
um, frame, so to speak. Um, so some things that you've done before might be taking you longer to do. So how can you maybe use some of the tools to make your teaching time or your marking time or feedback time more efficient? Um, so, you know, if you're giving feedback to students, you might want to do a little video of yourself doing feedback. You might find that's quicker than writing feedback to your students. That's one way to use the technology. Um, but just that, we, that T is really that notion of don't forget about that aim and learning outcome. That's what's driving your whole um, selection. Interactivity, um, and we're gonna touch on interactivity later this week um, and in some future weeks. Um, but you know, does your technology support student interaction in the course, um, like a discussion forum, for example, or a Zoom meeting like we're doing now? Um, what's, you know, is there an interactive component to it? Um, organizational issues. Um, so is there, you know, that's why I'm saying go talk to your university or your school in terms of the IT support. Um, because you want to make sure that there's some support for students on the technology that you use. Um, even if it's um, technology that's not supported by your institutions, a lot of different ones will have support. Um, you just want to make sure that's there. What And also consider what will your students do if the technology fails. So if you're asking them to, let's say that blog example, do a blog and it's not working or it fails on them or they lose something, what are the different mechanisms in place um, for your students if that fails? What do they do as an alternative, for example? Um, novelty. Um, so for some, um, choosing a new technology might have a novelty factor, um, might be exciting for you, might be exciting for your students. Um, Sometimes, though, you want to consider if it's really new to you, um, you know, are you prepared in case there are technical difficulties with it, or are you prepared to learn it? And that hints back to that ease of use as well. Um, if it's easy to use and it might be new and you're like, yeah, I'm going to give it a try. If it fails, that's okay. I've got other alternative things around it, then that's fine. But you just want to be a little bit cautious, especially when you're moving quickly to online, um, about that novelty factor. Um, and speed, the last um, word on the sections framework. So how, and it's really critical now, um, how quickly can you get up to speed with using that particular tool? How quickly can you use it to update content? Um, unfortunately, in the current um, mode of remote teaching quickly, we don't have a lot of time. Um, so the speed is the main issue. So that's the sections framework um, to think about um, those particular things when you're selecting your tool. So there's lots of technologies um, out there for various purposes, um, for assessment, there's quizzes, e-portfolios, wikis, you know, you could use blogs for assessment as well. Um, main things to consider when you're choosing a technology for assessment um, is you want to make sure students have time to practice with it before it becomes an assessed piece. Um, so if you want your students to say do a video recording of themselves and submit it to you um, as an assessed summative assessment piece, you want to have opportunities for them to practice that. Um, maybe they do a video and they share it with some peers um, just to make sure that the time that they're going to do that assess piece where um, their anxiety is heightened um, and it's really important for them because it's going to be graded is not the first time that they've used that particular technology or tool. So making sure they've got opportunity to practice. Instructions are really important. Have a colleague review your instructions just to make sure they're clear, um, especially if it's around using a particular tool or technology um, around assessment. Um, it's often nice to have somebody else just check over your words to make sure it's clear. Um, and Again, a technology could fail, even if it's something that's supported by the institution. It could, there's a chance, you know, they go to submit their assessment in their Dropbox and got lots and lots of students doing it at the same time and it lags for a little bit um, or everyone's trying to submit by that midnight deadline um, and it lags for a little bit and students can't get past the midnight deadline because now it's overdue. Those sort of things could happen, um, it's happened to me. Um, so making sure there's clear instructions for students. What should they do if it fails? Who should they contact? Um, don't make your assessments due at midnight. Make them do it, you know, in the, during the day. Um, we often put our assessments due at noon, um, so on a Monday, to make sure that there is somebody available to deal with, with the situation if the technology fails. Students know who to contact or how to alternatively submit it. 
Lots of technologies for interaction. Um, and like I said, we'll talk about interaction um, in a couple of days on Thursday, I believe. Um, there's discussion forums. You could use Twitter with hashtags. Um, might be harder to use, but if you're comfortable with Twitter, go for it. Um, Facebook groups. Now students love organizing themselves into Facebook groups. Um, and sometimes instructors do it as well, but what I've generally seen is they like to have that environment for themselves. They don't really want their teacher in there. Um, there could be privacy concerns with that as well, <clears throat> particularly if you have your own Facebook um, account. You don't want to share certain things with your students. They don't want to share certain things with you. Um, but often students do form their own online community. Um, and that tends to be their own Facebook pages and Facebook groups that they set up. Um, so sometimes you may find off oh, and not communicating in my discussion forums on my learning management system. Oh, they're actually communicating on Facebook. Um, they just don't want you to know that or you, they don't want you to see it. Um, but that's one of the tools out there. And of course, synchronous webinar type of tools like Zoom that we're using now. Um, and content creation, um, different technologies out there. Um, you can do video recordings around Panopto, Zoom and YouTube. Um, there's multimedia principles around that. I'm not going to touch on that today. Um, in a couple of weeks, I think we're focusing more on content creation and that's where I might talk more about multimedia principles. Um, but I wanted to highlight, especially um, when you're trying to now teach online, you don't always have to create your own content. You don't always have to um, create your own videos or your own resources. Um, there's lots of stuff out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Open educational resources, um, Creative Commons licensed resources are essentially free for you to use and um, in some cases adapt and use for your purpose. Um, so reach out to those things so that you don't feel that you have to create everything. Um, really quickly, there's three types of licensing out there. There's things that are copyrighted, um, Creative Commons and public domain. Um, you want to check with the resource website where it's coming from in terms of the terms to use. Um, as the teacher, you want to make sure you're not infringing on that copyright law. So really important to check that license before grabbing it. When in doubt, link to the resource. <clears throat> so if you like um, a particular website, a PDF you found somewhere, an image you found somewhere, a video you found somewhere, anything, um, I like to link out to it more than bringing it into the site because that way I know um, I'm not infringing on the copyright. Downside of that is you want to make sure those links are always working. Um, so you just want to check that link before um, you send it out to your students that it's still up and running. But when you're shifting pretty quickly, it's usually not a major issue. Um, that's just a diagram for you to look at around Creative Commons if you're not familiar with it. Um, I highly recommend that you explore it yourself on your own so that you have an understanding of the different licenses. Essentially, if something is Creative Commons licensed, um, it'll have one of those little icon things on there um, with that little person on it, for example. I'll say something like CCBY, um, which means you can copy and use it, um, or it might be a little bit more restrictive and say um, it's CCBYSA. Um, where you can't change the license, you know, there's different licenses around it, but essentially it's giving you an opportunity to explore the different resources created by others. You might want to put a Creative Commons license on your resources and course resources that you create yourself and share it with the community. I'm sure there'll be lots of teachers out there who would appreciate that. <clears throat> and those are my resources and references um, and the end to my session. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Negan. Um, there's a little bit of background noise going on here. Of course, somebody's going to decide to test the fire alarm. So uh, any comments or questions? I think what I liked about your discussion, Negan, is the, the focus on uh, intentional tool use, that you don't select the technology because it's a technology you've selected based on what it does to advance or contribute to the learning process as a whole. And I think it's a critical thing to look at because many institutions and many of you are making decisions now that comes in the form of hey we have teams on campus use teams or hey we have canvas on campus use canvas and in, in this current sort of situation where you maybe do not have the opportunity to think everything through intentionally I would encourage 
participants to at least think about and say, what is it that I want to achieve with my learning over the next two months? Uh, what kind of an environment do I want to create? And what's the minimal technology that I need in order to be able to achieve that? And it may end up being nothing that you've selected or the institution provides for you. Negan listed a series of tools that you might want to use, such as blogs and other technologies that aren't institutionally supported. You can use a range of resources like Google Groups for discussion or Google Docs for collaboration that aren't necessarily within an institution. So I think that's a key thing to be aware of is, is the, the technology shouldn't drive the teaching practices. The intended outcomes and goals, even in a high stress situation like right now where you're moving online rapidly, those should be framed through a lens of what do you want students to be able to do to know where to achieve. Um, so any questions or comments from anybody here in terms of uh, what you might have regarding tool selection or technology use? And by the way, I should say a uh, question in the discussion uh, or the chat area is just fine. Megan, you, one of the things that you do as well is you interact with a lot of institutional services. And this came up briefly yesterday, I think with both Justin, and, or not Matt and Tanya covered this, but it is that the university has teaching and learning support services available that can provide some guidance and use. Do you have any suggestions for faculty or teachers, staff, admin that are going to be, how, how do you liaise with existing university services in a way that helps you make sense of the, uh, the, what you can use and how you can get support beyond online, such as what we're doing here. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I can't say that every institution out there is um, providing support. I would guess they probably all are. Um, so there's people like myself, um, like Justin, like Matt, I mean, um, Anyone who's at all associated with educational technology and online learning and teaching is um, pulled apart at this point. Um, so go to your institutional, um, most institutions have, especially um, higher education institutions will have like a center for learning and teaching um, or a online teaching support group, or it might be in your individual discipline area. So if you're in a particular faculty, um, or school or academic unit, you might have your own instructional support person. Um, these people in general have a range of different titles um, internationally. I don't know why, but it might be someone that's called a learning designer, an instructional designer, um, an educational technologist, um, something like that. Go to those people or the Center of Educational Technology or Center for Learning and Teaching or Center for Online. Um, they are all rapidly trying at this point to um, increase the support that they're providing to their teachers and academics. Um, so go to their websites as the first point um, in terms of seeing what sort of workshops they're offering. A lot of these places are now offering virtual workshops. Um, so there's synchronous at particular times um, to suit where you are, but they're completely virtual, so you're not going to campus for them. They will be ranging on a range of tools. They will be probably focused on the institutional supported tools. Um, so if you're looking for support for something that's not supported at the university that you're from, um, might be a little bit hard, um, but you can certainly at least have a sense of what's offered. So they might be offering, like I know in our example, we're offering um, a range of workshops on how to use Zoom, how to set it up, how to facilitate small groups. Um, we'll be providing um, workshops around how you think about online assessment now. Um, you might be used to doing midterms and exams and now you're shifting to a completely different assessment approach. What do you do? Um, so um, go to those people. Um, there are, some of them might be doing virtual office hours now as well. Um, that's something that we're working with uh, because we aren't able to do the face-to-face -face anymore. Um, so yeah, most institutions will have some sort of level of support probably occurring for you. Um, and um, so yeah, reach out to those because they are happy to help you during this very difficult time. 
Thanks, Nathan. Uh, there's two quick questions and, and we want to shift over to Justin right away. So one was the and it's important to note as well, we the the Creative Commons license came up. There's a lot of great resources for Creative Commons available online. I believe, Nagan, you're going to be sharing your slides as well and they'll be put up on the website uh, shortly. So uh, we'll, we'll have that, those up for you to review. So that was just one question on briefly reviewing the Creative Commons uh, issue. And then there were, well, there's a couple other questions um, to, to address in there as well. One related to uh, the technical aspect of sharing uh, your Zoom window, uh, you know, so that you have both your face and your your PowerPoint, and, and you know some of those details uh, as well. But if you have a quick second to maybe respond to Creative Commons, and then we can respond through text to the other uh, conversations uh, that are happening in, in the thread, so we can get on to Justin's talk. Sure, um, I highly recommend taking a look at I think it's CreativeCommons.org um, to be able to look through um, the different types of licensing. Essentially, at the bottom corner of most resources that are Creative Commons licensed, instead of seeing that typical copyright symbol that you're probably used to seeing, um, it would have um, the Creative Commons symbol. And on there would be those acronyms. There's actually um, a website that you can put in those acronyms and it will actually spit out for you what those um, terms of conditions are for that. So we can probably share that via the group somehow, George, I imagine, um, in terms of you know, where to go to look at the different types of um, Creative Commons licensing and to know more about those. Yeah, I can add a resource to the website and Matt, Matt can put that on the uh, Pivot um, link website too, um, to the Creative Commons uh, page and we can make sure to share any resources there. And if you have any other, you know, questions, um, yeah, definitely please put it in the forum too if that doesn't help with um, what you need to know. Um, there was another question there. Um, thank you, Samin, um, around uh, is there a magic number around the number of collaboration tools students may be expected to learn given the short notice? So I think it's, um, you don't want to do a lot because you don't want to be overloaded a lot yourself um, and also your students. So it's almost at this point, it's, you know, minimal viable product, um, something I, we tend to say quite often. Um, what is the bare minimum that you really need um, in order to get through the next few weeks, months, et cetera, with your students online. Um, start with one, see how it goes. If it works, you might wanna try another one. Um, or you might wanna try one, give it a couple of weeks and it doesn't work, pull it off, try something else. Um, it is a bit of a, you know, you might wanna do a little trial and error, but I wouldn't go off and do too many. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not, terribly confident with the tools, start with say the discussion forum in your learning management system. It's a safe entry way pathway to an interaction collaboration type of tool. Um, if you want your students to collaborate on a, on a document, like a working document, Google Docs um, is pretty particularly good for that. Um, and students will have to set up a Google account um, if they don't have one, but it's pretty easy and user friendly to use. Um, so that's what I would say. Um, keep it simple. Um, start with one, add on another one if you feel confident to do so. And then maybe add on another one if you want, but don't go um, too crazy with it because students do like um, consistency as well. So it's just in the face to face. They're used to coming to the same lecture hall or the same seminar room. They'll be used. To, they'll start getting used to going to the same place for collaboration. Um, there was a question around sharing screen. Um, I didn't do anything particularly whizzy around that. I think I just, on Zoom, um, because I have host privileges, I can share my screen, I think. Um, so I just clicked on share screen. I selected um, my PowerPoint um, that I had prepared in the background um, that showed the PowerPoint and uh, Zoom did the fancy stuff by keeping my face on the screen as well. Sorry, that's not very helpful, but um, the tool essentially was very easy to use. Yeah, and as a Matt's replied as well, you know, there are different settings that you can use on the preference tab to configure how you're presented, how your slides are presented, how big your face is, how little your face is. So all of that uh, in time, you know, these kinds of things, Google is always your friend around technical things and a quick search and, and Zoom has a rich range of tutorials that you can look at as well. Uh, Justin, let's go uh, over to you. I know we've got about another 30 minutes left here, so we will, uh, if you have the ability to, let's see, are you there? yeah, you're there, you got your video going. Uh, over to you, let's uh, go through your perspective on tool selection for online teaching learning. Hi, so um, again, I'm Justin Dellinger, I'm the Associate Director, Director of the Link Research Lab in the Center for Research on Teaching and Learning Excellence at UT Arlington. 
Um, I have uh, about 14 years experience working in the online space, um, both uh, uh, academic coach, K-12 teacher, um, lecturer, and uh, running uh, online MOOCs in, in edX with, with George. And um, I think um, it's one of those things, we were, we're all kind of going through this right now, um, this, this big shift. In fact, I know like Matt and I are uh, helping, I think the term we're using is triaging a lot of things at, at our university and helping uh, new faculty. Like we just got an email even a few minutes ago that uh, said that, hey, the rest of our semester is now fully online. So, you know, we're preparing for things like that. And, you know, I think, I think you know, when we have these moments here, um, we, you know, we just try to do the best that we can. We use what we have to be able to move forward. And, you know, we only have a couple months left for a traditional, you know, you know, long semester um, kind of program um, yeah, that, that most, a lot of students are, are going to be in. So um, when we were um, talking about um, slide, uh, and the slides I'm going to share here, um, trying to think about the kind of tools that people might be able to use. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, So, um, sorry, I'm over here. Um, we're trying to think of some really common things that people can use that may be outside of the institution. So, um, one thing in particular that I want to reiterate is, is some of the things that, that Megan said, and that is, you know, really start thinking about what you need from your course, what's going to help the students get through it, okay, and then and then go from there before you go and, and focus on any technologies. And you have to think about how the technology is going to support what you want to achieve and what your students need to learn. And, um, you know, make sure to consider, you know, what you have access to, um, you know, some of these things might be accessibility factors, um, you know, if you just go and pick the really obscure tools or things that have cost, um, especially at this point of the semester, um, there are a lot of um, challenges with that. Um, and especially, I mean, if, if you didn't lay it out in your syllabus in advance or, or um, you know, expectations for department um, purchases, um, you know, departmental standards that are put out and things like that. But so the biggest thing I just want to say is, you know, if you have to ask, 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 you know, your institution, ask Center for Teaching and Learning staff, your department, um, if you um, are working within a college, um, that kind of thing too. So um, I was trying to think of some things that might be outside because there's just so many tools out there to choose from. So um, I would try to pick things that were, that were free and relatively easy to move into that might be outside of your institutional um, context, like different things that your institution has procured. Um, so one is WordPress. And I say .com because um, WordPress, you know, there are a lot of different ways you can do it. It's, it's very, very common. A lot of the, the web is powered through WordPress um, and you can have local hosting or you could use you know, like the free WordPress.com site. Um, another one is just YouTube. Um, we all use it to watch videos all the time, but there is some power in it in the fact that there's, um, there's and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but, but some, some flexibility with it and, and the fact that it's, you know, mobile, things like that. And then I also want to talk about some just easy accessibility checkers that might be out there. And again, I realize that maybe not everybody's going to have access to all these things, but I just want to share and, you know, explore the tools that you do have at your university for things like um, accessibility checkers. Not everybody you know, is going to have Ally like we have or, or Office, you know, 365 suite or things like that. But um, I'm talk about creating something in WordPress and, and, and why I chose WordPress. So um, we've, Matt and I um, have, have both been big proponents of, of using that um, for, for different reasons. Um, one thing that I've done is, is I actually have a background teaching US history. And um, one of the things I really want to do is have my students create a bunch of artifacts, especially for history teachers in particular too, and um, being able to build sort of like almost like a portfolio of their own that they could be able to curate and have things um, that they could keep outside of the learning environment. Because a lot of times um, you have a learning management system, you submit something and then it goes and it's gone, right? But if you are hosting say your own site and you can share things that um, through, through that means, then you, um, might be able to use that, say, if you want to put, you know, get like a teacher portfolio or something like that together. Um, so there's some really good um, pros to using something like WordPress, and that is free. Um, that you know, you don't have to have any institutional licenses. It's it's a pretty easy process to get through to be able to get an account. Um, you get the full control and the ownership. You get to decide what goes into it, um, both as an instructor and for the students that are um, creating the accounts as part of it as well. Um, 
there's extensive support base. I think this is really important in that you, if you have some questions or you need to grab a thing of HTML because you just don't have an HTML a background in doing anything in HTML, you could probably go and find that pretty easily if you wanted to do specific things. Um, there are lots of add-ons, lots of plugins and things that you can do. Um, for instance, um, we'll talk about, let's say, Jetpack here and the ability to take a post that you do and be able to push it out to your social media accounts if you wanted to do something like that. And again, there's just a lot of flexibility with a lot of customization, um, but that's also one of the cons in that if you use something like this and it is this customizable that you know you can break it <laughs> or you, may, you can uh, know enough to get you in kind of trouble sort of thing um, and you have to be able to do you have to be able to keep it up you have to be able to sometimes uh, do backups um, be able to make sure that your security is in, in place back things like that um, and there's a little bit of a learning curve as opposed to maybe some other sites that are out there um, that have like drag and drop features where you can just you know move a thing into like a, a block and and put text in or an image or that kind of thing um, you might actually have to to do a little HTML here or there things like that um, so uh, again let's just grab this from wordpress.com um, for instance, I mentioned um, you know some of pl uh, the, the plugins. So you have like uh, the, the Jetpack, right? As I said, that's something that I have installed on mine. Um, there's lots of different themes, um, and I've seen some students pick some some pretty crazy ones out there. You might want to give some guidance on on some of that if you can in advance. Um, and then uh, with WordPress, um, I think one of the one of the things is is that you can publish things openly, but if your students don't want to publish things openly and you know for purposes of things like FERPA um, you can have things um, published in a password protected way or, or even listed as well so as you see on the on the right side of the screen here um, there is the password protection option so something that I've done in my, in my history classes is I've had students go and create a, a blog post about a certain topic um, that, that they did some research on and they shared images and that sorts of thing. But if they didn't want to have it open, um, what they could do is they could send me a link to this page um, and then they could uh, give me the password to be able to do it. And they actually could submit it through the learning management system. So in this case, it was Blackboard at the time. Um, they went to the assignment area and in the text box, they just did the URL there and they gave me the password and I was able to go in, access it, give a grade, and um, and move along, you know, with my day, just like as if they submitted a Word doc in there as well. But the difference is, is instead of just having a Word doc that went into Blackboard and you know disappeared forever, this is you know website that they could have if they wanted to be able to use it, um, especially after they graduated. So um, just some thoughts about that. You know, there's other customizations we talked about. You, know, you could tag things if you wanted to be able to sort. Um, and we've also used um, WordPress and blogs for some, like even the MOOCs that we've run. Um, so Matt um, created for the Yoga MOOC um, a that that we ran uh, about three years ago um, in edX, and um, we had this um, basically it's a space where it's a learner activity hub um, where learners um, we basically we had them submit um, basically um, submit their their blogs to us and we were able to put it up on here to where anybody could go and access um, the different activities. So there, when you click on the different icons there, it would take you to the individual blog depending on the assignment um, that was there. So um, we have, I'm gonna have um, instructions to um, how to create the learning hub if you're interested in doing that. Matt did a really, really great job, um, really great job of creating very detailed instructions for, for how to do that. So another thing is, um, if you watched my video, um, the, the introduction, I um, was at the, uh, the hospital yesterday morning um, before the course went live uh, with my wife and so we're about almost 20 weeks, 21 weeks pregnant uh, now. And um, so I thought that might be a good opportunity to do my video there and show that you could create video anywhere. Um, I used my phone, I just held it up. I was in a certain area, but sometimes that might even be a really great thing. Like say you wanted, to, uh, Again, is a history teacher. I've been certain places, and I've wanted to do short videos. And let's say I'm in front of the Alamo, and I'm in San Antonio presenting at a conference. I've actually created content for my course for, for future courses using you know video right there as I'm at the location. This is a really kind of uh, cool um, 
cool opportunity to be able to do something like that. But you know, the one thing is I, um, as I mentioned, even in my introduction, introductory video is that, um, you know, these things can be sloppy. They don't have to be in professional studio settings with the uh, three point lighting in front of you or the halo or, or those sorts of things. Um, you can do, um, you can do video from, um, you know, just being able to do it from like, your mobile device. Um, there are, of course, the challenges with that, um, particularly um, for, on the accessibility side of you create long videos, um, you, you know, have to have you know, things like transcripts um, for, for uh, certain students that might need that. So, um, you know, but with, with something like YouTube, you know, you, again, you can have a free account. It's very flexible. You can do a lot of things with it between using the mobile app and being able to create artifacts. It's almost like having a WordPress in that you post videos like, like a blog in this case. Um, now, one challenge with YouTube here um, was needing to have access to the internet as opposed to um, some other um, things or you might be able to download a podcast or download other things. Now, there are of course many ways around that, um, but but you know for the purposes of, of this, yeah, it, that could present a challenge, and it's something that you need to keep in mind. I, as we saw with, with my university going fully online for the semester, we have students and and you know in the emails we're encouraging them to go home. Well, at home, are they going to have sufficient high speed internet and to be able to watch a high quality video? And you need to think about that even like when you're creating your slides or things like that, because um, if you can't get really good high quality 1080p, you know, things, is it going to really mess up what the slide says? And is it going to be readable? That kind of stuff. So, um, you know, things seem like that just to, just to think about. And you know, sometimes there can be some difficulty editing. I know <laughs> I raised with George uh, about a couple weeks ago about trying to edit a video in, uh, in YouTube. It's, it's, it didn't take a lot of my um, edits that I did. That was a little bit frustrating, but you know, overall, in general, I think it could be a pretty useful tool. So one of the things you can do, even from the app, is, and from this is from uh, this image right here is from the uh, from the website. But in the top right corner, there's a little little camera with a plus sign, and you can just click on that, and you can either create a live event or you could um, upload a video. Let's say if you had one from your um, on, on your uh, phone, um, and like um, I mentioned for WordPress there are options to be able to share videos privately. So um, if you want your students to be able to use it, they could not use the, their actual name um, and they could still be able to create something on the web and then um, they could have the option as you see on the bottom right on the visibility might make it private. And then um, you have the, um, on the top right, you see the ability to share it privately. And basically what it is, it sends you an email. Now that unfortunately, there's no option to put it in like, uh, like an assignment um, the same way um, it would send you an email that way. But um, it's, it at least gives you options for students um, to be able to, to share videos um, with you without necessarily putting their name out on the web. And students do have reasons for, for doing that. Um, so it's just important to, to take that seriously um, as needed. So I also want to talk about a, a few quick accessibility tools because you're going to, you know, if, if you have not worked in the space and you have a lot of uh, Word documents or other things and you need to quickly move in there and you have um, accessibility um, challenges there, um, there, there are some things that, that are out there that are, that are really quick and easy. And again, I don't know what your institution may or may not have, um, but I do know that um, I at least wanted to show that there are things like this. So if you don't have these, um, at least Microsoft 365 Suite or you know, Adobe Acrobat 17 like I have, um, you can ask your university and see if maybe you have something like that, your college or your university. So the first one is WAVE, um, and WAVE is by WebAIM, um, which is out of um, Utah State University. Um, I think they've been operating since 1999, very long time. Um, and this right here is um, one of the actual, uh, so, so basically it's a tool that you can plug in a URL and it will give you feedback on your website. Now something to keep in mind is it's gonna identify some things, it's not always gonna be 100% applicable, but it can give you guidance on some things that might be things that you can change. Like for instance, um, if you have a screen reader and it's looking at headers for things and you use just bigger font as opposed to using the header feature on a page, um, that might cause some issues with how the screen reader reads your page. Just something to keep in mind and think about there. So Wave you know, is, is great for, for web pages here. Um, 
Word and, and, and PowerPoint in the 365 suite um, have accessibility checkers built into them. It may not again be perfect and may not catch everything, but at least it's going to help you and kind of think about that. So if you would like your, your course, uh, your, sorry, your uh, application menu, um, you'll see something that says check for issues and there's, there's an accessibility checker there. And even with how, you know, created by slides here, um, there is the ability to um, put alt text directly into the images here. So um, all the PowerPoints that we know we're putting together for this course. I'm putting, um, I'm taking all those and making sure that we have correct alt text to for them and things like that. So, um, you know, if you have the ability to do just as descriptive images too, um, if it's just a nice, you know, nice flowery picture, great. Um, for purely decorative purposes, you can just check that off. And then um, the last one here I had was Adobe Acrobat. Um, this also has a tool. You have to click on that tools button again, again in 2017 here. Um, the version I have, but and there are other ones that might have this as well. But just look around, you see, you can do like a full scan on this one uh, and like this PDF here that I have and, and be able to see, okay, wait a second, this image might not have alt text, that kind of thing, very similar. So the last thing I wanted to talk about with the time that we had here is um, we did create um, an, an online learning experiences um, book that's in um, the UT Arlington uh, Press Books uh, page. It's free and open for anybody to use. Um, there are some things in here that might be useful if you want to think about tools. Um, Matt's done a really good job of putting this together. He was the lead author, um, but we had this um, shared very broadly and we have reviewers from, from around the globe um, that did a great job and, and, and gave us really good feedback on this. Um, we definitely, I think, want to update this as we go forward. There's some, some stuff that's a little bit older, but um, um, I think this could be a really good resource for you and we'll definitely include this in the, um, in the resources after the session as well. So again, thank you for your time. Um, I'd definitely take any questions that you have here. I think I saw a couple of things in the chat, but George, do you wanna? Sure. So one of the things while we're uh, waiting as you know, a heavy focus on this course is we wanna provide individuals with sort of a research centric view on, mm -hmm. on a, a, you know, a number of these topics. So is there something just in an article or two that you would like to point people to? Because I think you, you addressed a really key issue around, you don't need to function with any university architecture. Uh, there is a range of tools available, distributed online tools. There's a range of practical uh, steps involved with video creation on YouTube, with uh, using blog posts for creating these, these, these networks of interaction. But it, 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 off top, of, you don't need to answer off the top of your head, but maybe post in, in our follow-up discussion. Yeah. But what are the the articles and the resources that indicate sort of the research evidence or approaches that these are effective ways of teaching and learning online? So I just want to flag that uh, as, yeah. as sort of an, an FYI. Matt has done a good job addressing all of the questions I think that have come up in the uh, in the uh, discussion form so if there's still something outstanding I, I don't think there's anything that I didn't see Matt addressed because uh, he's been busy uh, addressing or answering all the questions that things go forward including recently some stuff on, on accessibility can you talk a little bit so you looked at tools that give instructors control which I think is really the heart of it, where you have the ability to create the kind of learning experience and the kind of learning environment that you want with the examples that you went through. Are there some points that you would give to faculty or to staff or teachers that are starting to move online? Because there is an increase in some of the technical dynamics of running WordPress and managing WordPress or doing your video upload to YouTube versus doing everything in Canvas or a comparable LMS. What advice would you give to teachers that are saying, I'm willing to make that trade off a little more complexity with the tool sets that I use. I need to learn a little bit more, but I have greater control over how I create the learning experience for my students. What would you direct instructors to be aware of or to be mindful of it as if they make that transition? I think that one of the things that's that's uh, really important is is to understand, um, and I've done this with, with, with my students for sure, is um, letting them know, hey, we're trying something new, and um, you know, I'm I'm also learning here. I don't know everything about this, but um, you know that the students aren't going to get punished for for trying something uh, new here. And if something's really not working, being willing to abandon if necessary, and finding an alternative way to do it, and just keep that in mind that with all technology, even if you're going to do synchronous live session and then Teams dies. Um, the, you know that you can have other ways of being able to, to, to do different activities. So just keep that in mind with, with the technology and that, um, you know, definitely just get out ahead of it and try to anticipate questions that might exist. 
Um, one of the things that I've built out for my courses whenever I've done things like in in, in edX, sorry, edX, in um, WordPress is um, to, to be able to just have like an FAQ that helps scaffold students in. So there are very common issues that tend to arise. And here are some, you know, very simple ways to be able to do that. I'll cut down on the number of emails and things like that that you might have. Sometimes even just creating a quick one, two minute video showing how to do a post in WordPress. Um, has substantially cut down on the amount of time and energy um, put into like support purposes and things like that. So um, I do see something that, that Nina wrote in there, which is, yeah. I forgot to mention this, so thank you Nina for bringing it up, is that yeah, universe, non-university approved tools is definitely a, a big thing, particularly in this era. Um, I know that with my university, yeah, we think we have to go through uh, ER office, OIT office, <laughs> we have to go through all the acronym offices to be able to get things approved. So absolutely, it's something for you to consider that if you do bring an outside tool that's not been approved, um, that you might need to uh, do something to uh, to be able to get it approved. Now, I've not had issues with this in the past. It can be sometimes a really quick process. Other times it can take a long time depending on the tool that you have, but something like WordPress would hopefully be a lot easier to do. Um, so it's just something that, um, you want to be very aware of. Um, again, that's going to depend on your institutional context. My university, yes, that would make me fill out a, a form to be able to um, say what students are using, how they're using it, that kind of thing, and then who else, um, you know, who else might be using it on the staff or faculty side. And there was a follow-up question as well uh, around the, uh, you know, is it better to do basic content delivery that is somewhat incomplete, say not having visuals or, or videos, or to do a mediocre job with those capabilities with a tool that you are not good at? And I think that's a fantastic question, Marta, that's gonna be different in different settings. And I'm gonna ask Justin yeah. to answer it and then I'll see if uh, Matt can address it as well. And I'd love to hear Tanya's uh, take too, of course, Nagan. So let's do a quick run through all the, all the people who are teaching this course. Justin. Yeah, you can start with me, huh? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think that, um, honestly, I, I think, uh, it just it really depends on you um, and, 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 and kind of what you want to do with it. If you can get based off of what you, know, what you want your students to um, achieve in the course um, and you can do it with, with, with basic things and that's all you feel that you have the bandwidth capacity to do, I'd recommend doing that at least for, you know, if you're on a long semester finishing up in May here um, to, to, to do that. If you feel like you can do a little bit more, invest some time and energy into experimenting and trying some different things, you know, definitely do that. All right, I don't know if I see. Oh, no, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, um, I echo what Justin just said. Um, I think it's also important to know you're not in it alone. Um, if we weren't in the situation you were on campus and you were going to try something new, you might be just walking down the hallway and knocking on your colleague's door and say, Hey, how do I do this? Hey, I heard you've done this. Can you give me some tips? Um, so don't feel that just because you're working from home and you're doing this remotely that you are on your own. You're not. Reach out to your colleagues, um, you know, via email or whatever communication mechanism you are using and do the exact same thing. You know, hi, so-and-so, I've heard you're doing this. I heard you tried blogs last week. How did it go? Did it work for you? Okay, great. What do I need to consider if I want to try to use it in my class? Um, so it's almost the same in a sense in that if you were going to try something new or something different and you were still going to campus, you would still be asking people some questions, whether that's your colleague down the hall, um, your graduate student maybe, your Center for Learning and Teaching, um, Google, um, the community that we've established here in this MOOC um, is another place that you can share your ideas and um, get feedback from others who might have tried something and they can give you some tips and tricks. So really, um, communicate with your colleagues, share ideas. Um, I would say is my my tip in terms of getting started with um, online remote learning. Thanks, Nagan. Matt? Yeah, um, I think it's a good question. As I almost always am using tools that are very old because I'm used to them and I'm not afraid to just grab something and use it. If you look at the website, the alternative website that we have for this outside of edX, all the graphics on that were created in Fireworks 8, which I think is like 500 years old now. 
Um, and I'm also typing things out in WordPress and things out there. So I am, I am never afraid to just do whatever I do uh, in stuff that, that are tools that I know already if I have to act together. Um, if you find a tool that is better, uh, it's also okay to do a mediocre job in that as well. I'm also learning a new interface in WordPress called Gutenberg uh, for this class as well, and, and sometimes mess up that as well. But I would personally say don't spend a lot of time that you don't have at this point with all the crazy stuff that's going on out there trying to learn something if you can do it easily in something that you already know. Right, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Matt. I don't think Tanya's here. I know she had to step a little bit earlier. So we're down to our last couple minutes here. If anybody has any additional questions, uh, feel free to uh, raise them at this point. I think one of the takeaways here, obviously, is that there's a plethora of tools that are available to you as academics, as staff that support uh, teaching online, or even as administrators in some instances. I think the question that you'll need to tackle for yourself is that set of uh, interacting factors, your own expertise, the learning outcomes that you want to achieve, the profile of your students, the degree to which it's supported by the campus, and if it's not supported, then the flexibility that they have for you to use tools that are perhaps not formally endowed by the, by the organization, but that do have the ability to still advance and improve learning, and so on. So there's a range of different resources and questions that are going to be unique to every context and to every environment. Any final thoughts, Negan and Justin, from either of you as we move toward wrapping? Not really, um, other than um, good luck, reach out, use the MOOC to share ideas. I think there's forums on there where you can share ideas. And um, really, I think at this time, um, don't feel isolated and um, we're all here for you. Yeah, definitely. And I, I echo that, please use the forums. And if you have any additional questions, you know, one hour is not a lot of time to be able to cover a topic like this. And, and, and again, we're going to cover more as the course goes along. Um, this is, you know, these sessions um, during this first week are just quick things to be able to try to help you where you're at right now. And again, we know that a lot of universities are moving very quickly at this time. So, um, you know, please uh, let us know if you have any questions in the forums. We'll definitely make sure to follow those. All right, thanks both for, for uh, time and effort in pulling these, these thoughts together. We're going to be spending time on tomorrow hearing from students or what's the experience of students and what do students wish that faculty and staff knew as they began moving uh, content online. So look forward to having you involved in that. As both Justin and Negan mentioned, there is a forum in the edX environment where you can ask questions and engage as well, sort of asynchronously. So I encourage you to drop in there. Next week, we're going to start more formally with a structured review of content and resources. There'll be a bibliography that we'll share with you on each of these related topics as we move through the course as well. So we'll continue fleshing out some of the research dimensions while touching on the practical components as well. Hope you all have a great rest of your day and we'll see many of you tomorrow.